On this morning of worship, this Pentecost 8, we turn our attention to the Word of our God. Our first lesson, our Old Testament lesson, is found recorded for us in the book of Amos, Amos chapter 7, verses 10 through 15. You'll know, first you're going to hear about Amaziah. Amaziah is a priest at Bethel. Bethel is a false temple. Amaziah is a false prophet. Amaziah, of course, is opposing Amos. Amos is the prophet of the Lord. And Amos simply says, you know, I didn't want to do this, but the Lord sent me. And that's the nature of a prophet. You're there to proclaim God's word and what God says. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent a message to Jeroboam, king of Israel. Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to endure all his words. This is what Amos says. Jeroboam will die by the sword, and Israel will certainly go into exile away from its own soil. Then Amaziah said to Amos, You seer, get out of here. Flee to the land of Judah. You may eat food and prophesy there, but you must never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the sanctuary of the king and the national temple. Then Amos responded to Amaziah, I was not a prophet, nor was I a son of a prophet. Rather, I was a sheep breeder and took care of sycamore fig trees. But the Lord took me from tending flocks, and the Lord said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. We continue then with our scripture lessons, turning our attention then to our epistle lesson. Our epistle lesson is found recorded for us in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. Do note, this text will serve as the basis for our sermon. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. He did this when he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, so that we would be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ. He did this in accordance with the good purpose of his will and for the praise of his glorious grace, which he has graciously given us in the one he loves. In him we also have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in keeping with the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. He made known to us the mystery of his will, in keeping with his good purpose, which he planned in Christ. This was to be carried out when the time had fully come, in order to bring all things together in Christ, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have also obtained an inheritance, because we were predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in keeping with the purpose of his will. He did this so that his glory would be praised as a, re as a result of us, who were the first to hope in Christ. In him, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and in him, when you also believed, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. He is the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of God's own possession, so that his glory would be praised. Here ends our epistle lesson. Rise to the gospel. Holy Gospel for this morning is found recorded for us in Mark chapter 6, verses 7 through 13. This section of God's word, we're hearing how Jesus sent out his disciples, sent them out to preach repentance and the forgiveness of sins in our Lord and Savior, sent them out to begin that work of ministry. Jesus called the twelve and began to send them out two by two. He gave them authority over the unclean spirits instructed them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their money belts. They were to put on sandals, but not to wear two coats. He said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that area. Any place that, you will, that will not receive you or listen to you, as you leave there, shake off the dust that is under your feet as a testimony against them. They went out and preached that people should repent. They also drove out many demons. They anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. Here ends our gospel lesson.
Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The word of our God that we turn our attention to this morning is found recorded for us in Ephesians chapter 1. Let me highlight for you verse 11. In him we have also obtained an inheritance because we were predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in keeping with the purpose of his will. Thus far, God's word lets you and I, of course, continue with prayer. Merciful Father, again we come and give you thanks that we are able to gather together to give you worship and praise and glory and honor. And of course we give you this worship and praise because of your Son, Jesus Christ, and what he has done for us. Help us, dear Lord, to contemplate your words before us, Help us to grasp the comfort and the encouragement they truly are and help us to simply believe in Jesus. Amen. We have before us the doctrine of election. It really is a wonderful truth of God. It's a tr comforting truth of God that all the more brings out the absolute grace of our God in our eternal life and salvation. And yet people get hung up on things and often those hang-ups are the result of emphasizing something that should not be emphasized. So let you and I make sure that we grasp the total comfort, joy, and marvel this teaching of our Savior is. Our theme will simply be, in Him we are chosen. Now we're going to take this section by section. So verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Dear people, here's an opening verse. A verse that simply wants us to marvel in the total and absolute goodness of God. <clears throat> this verse tells us God is to be praised. And not just any God but the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why? He is the true God. He is the only God. He is the triune God who with His Son and with His Holy Spirit has effected and carried out by total grace our eternal life and salvation. That's what this verse tells you. In God, through Christ, we have been given every spiritual blessing. And these blessings are found no matter where you are, whether you're in heaven or on earth or under the earth. This is true because all of creation is the realm of God. And God has made possible the total and absolute spiritual blessings we need to attain eternal life and salvation. And please note, the emphasis of this verse is God and God's blessing to us in Christ. When you take your eyes off of that truth, it may be that you may lose this truth of God. Verses 10, or 4 through 10. He did this when he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, so that we would be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ. He did this in accordance with the good purpose of his will and for the praise of his glorious grace, which he has graciously given us in the one he loves. In him we also have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in keeping with the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. He made known to us the mystery of his will in keeping with his good purpose, which he planned in Christ. This was to be carried out when the time had fully come in order to bring all things together in Christ, things in heaven and things on earth. Now please note that this section is truly and only about the work and redemption of Jesus. Let me make to you clearly and exactly what is being said here. Our gracious God and Lord, before he even laid the foundation of the world, already had in mind your eternal life and salvation in Jesus. Now, if you want to emphasize anything that's found here, then please focus on God's omniscience 
that God knows absolutely everything or focus on God's eternity that God is timeless and as a result, God sees his creation from beginning to end. And why is this important? Because we're learning something about God and our salvation. As God was planning this creation of ours, it's clear that God was planning from beginning to end. God saw the whole of his creation even before that creation came into being. God saw the perfection that he was going to create. God saw Adam and Eve bringing to his creation sin and literally then destroying God's goodness therein that is in his creation. God then planned. He chose to save us in Christ Jesus, his son and our savior. That's right. Before even one atom of matter was laid or ever existed in this world, God already knew everything that would be, and God took steps to make sure that the prized possession of his creation, the souls of mankind, had every opportunity to be restored and rescued from this horror of sin. Yeah, all of this before creation's time even began. This salvation, this redeeming would be in and through Jesus. God predestined things in Jesus. He planned Jesus. God promised Jesus. God worked to deliver in Jesus. God fulfilled all our spiritual needs in Jesus. God sent Jesus to the cross where our sins, the sins of all of mankind from beginning to end, were paid for. But not partially but fully paid for and absolutely paid for by the redemptive work of Jesus. God's intent from the very beginning is that we be saved, that we be rescued from the sin that would plague our lives and souls. And so Jesus came. Jesus fulfilled exactly what God had predestined, that the souls of mankind, all of mankind would be atoned for. Jesus did this by his sacrifice on the cross, which brings us the forgiveness of sins. And, and did you see that line in this section? Great line. Don't miss that line. We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in keeping with the goodness or the riches of his grace. And do you know why that line's there? To make sure everyone grasps and understands that Jesus paid for every sin, for every soul, for all of eternity. That line is telling us that God didn't have Jesus just die for the sins of believers or just die for this select few or that select few. Jesus died for all. Jesus paid for all. And this payment from the beginning was the gracious plan of God in accord with the depth and wonder of his grace. And now catch the next lines. He made known to us the mystery of his will in keeping with his good purpose, which he planned in Christ. This was to be carried out when the time had fully come, in order to bring all things together in Christ, things in heaven and things on earth. Now I'm going to tell you, this, this particular section just makes my mind real. Because here is God pointing to the fact that everything, everything in this world of ours, and yes, including the very realms of heaven, everything comes together in Jesus. Jesus had made known the mystery of God. Jesus has revealed God's total grace and love, his power and awe, his complete mercy for his children and the world. All is in Jesus. And need I remind you that Jesus is clearly and precisely called in his word, the word. The whole of scripture from the beginning to the end is rooted in, founded on, built upon, the sta and stands in and through Jesus. Now come verses 11 through 12, which simply amplifies this truth of Jesus. In him we also have obtained an inheritance, because we were predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in keeping with the purpose of his will. He did this so that his glory would be praised as a result of us who were the first to hope in Christ. 
Now, these words emphasize Jesus. And then I want you to notice the we. It's actually a reference to all those who were eyewitnesses to Jesus. All of those who experienced Jesus and his miracles and had a, per, a, a, a personal knowledge of the crucifixion, the death, and resurrection of Jesus. And this group is defined as what? The first to hope in Christ. In other words, they grasped the wonder of Jesus. They were directly and personally impacted by Jesus. That first group of believers is in Jesus, the living Jesus. They were impacted by Jesus because that's exactly how God had planned things. That's how things were predestined. And then the next line. In him, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and in him, when you also believed, you were sealed with the promise Holy Spirit. He is the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of God's own possession so that his glory would be praised. And here, dear people, is the truth for the rest of us. We have heard of Jesus. We've heard of Jesus through the gospel message. We heard of Jesus and through the work of and the power of the Holy Spirit unleashed on us in Jesus' gospel, we believe in Jesus. We have eternal life and salvation in Jesus. We are kept in that faith through the Holy Spirit until our redemption is completed, pointedly, until you are called to your heavenly home in Jesus. So let's just sum all of this up so far. God understood what would happen. God planned our redemption from sin through his son, Jesus. God set up the promises. God operated in the world in connection with those promises. God delivered Jesus in accordance with those promises. Jesus revealed the full scope and reality of these promises of God by fulfilling all that God had promised. That fulfillment included Jesus going to the cross to pay for our sins and Jesus' resurrection to make sure that we knew absolutely this hope of Jesus, and the hope is simple, because he lives, you also will live. And then the Father and the Son sent the Holy Spirit to make sure we grasp everything that God has done in Jesus. The Holy Spirit gives us God's word that is founded on testifies to and grants the wonder of Jesus and all the truth that is necessary for us to get the reality of what God has planned. And that reality is simply the forgiveness of sins and eternal life in Jesus. Now isn't that simple? God has done everything for us in Jesus. Heaven is ours because of Jesus. God has so loved you that God, Jesus, died for your sins and was raised for your eternal salvation and life. The emphasis here is on Jesus and what has been done for us in Jesus. A plan of God given and laid forth even before, before the first nano quark ever came into physical existence. But people do foolish things. They see that word predestined and they decide that that word means their whole life is planned out and that God has already set whether they will believe or not. And you have to understand, if you're going to talk about your damnation, it's a horrid mistake to think that God has predestined you to damnation. That's a false teaching. God has predestined you to salvation. It is true. You are saved because God has loved you. Jesus has died and risen for you. And then the Holy Spirit has called you to faith and life in Jesus. And we know this as the doctrine of election to salvation. That God has called us. God has chosen us in Jesus to eternal life. And remember that Jesus died for the sins of all people. God loves all souls. God sends his Holy Spirit to all. That has always been the plan of God. 
everyone is adopted as God's children in Christ. So you need to grasp what is not true is that God elects us or determines that our eternal damnation. No! This section makes clear that God had Jesus die for all. This section makes clear that the message of Jesus is for all. This section makes clear that God's word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, is available to all. You have been adopted as God's heirs of eternal life. That's the message to all. But souls reject this. They reject the truth that there is a God. They reject the wonder of Jesus. They scorn at sin and deride the idea that there is an eternal life or an eternal death. Men, men of their sinful nature turn away from the perfect gift given to them in Jesus and they blame God for this. Souls were blind. God gave sight. And yet most souls gouged their eyes out. Souls were dead. God gave life. And yet most souls commit spiritual suicide rather than live or acknowledge God. Souls were adopted by God as his very own children. And yet most souls of this world act as if being a child of God is the last thing they would ever be. God has given his truth and souls reject that truth as foolishness and idiocy. And they do that in the name of all sorts of things. And then I'm going to tell you, you also need to be aware of the fact that in this world of ours, this very world of ours, and our very own sinful flesh, work hard against this truth of God. So it's our nature ever since sin. And it's why Adam and Eve hid from God once they had sinned, though nothing about God had changed. It was Adam and Eve who changed, who had lost in that fatal act of disobedience the truth and knowledge of God's grace and love. And then I say, well, what then? What then, you and me? Do we grasp the marvel of Jesus? Do we understand that God so loved us that he sent his son to be our savior? That's, that's the point of Jesus. From the very plan of creation, God knew us. God loved us and God planned for us to be with him in Jesus. Hold it. We have excuses. Things like, well, why didn't God stop Adam and Eve? Well, I believe, people, without a doubt, that God, through that whole process of Adam and Eve's temptation, God guided them, God instructed them, God gave them every truth they needed to know and grasp. Most important, God had given them holiness and perfection. And yet Adam and Eve, on their own, determined that eating that fruit would be okay. And then you realize God was not and God is not at fault. Or the fact that our world has serious problems and difficulties. But dear people, God explains it all. God reveals the truth of the destruction of sin and the evil of this world. Yet, we get angry with God because of our struggles. We think God is being unfair to us or hateful and such. We fail to simply believe what God has said. He wants all to be saved. He works in every life for the eternal good and salvation of that soul. Yet we reject that working of God for our eternal life and salvation. We spurn him because we think we know better. And what happens when we turn away from the word of truth? Did you not hear in this section that we are saved 
sealed and protected by the word of truth, the gospel of salvation in Jesus. And yet we stop going to church. We stop listening to God's word. We miss this food of life for this reason and that reason, and we think it's no big deal. But dear people, it is our spiritual food and nourishment. It's how our souls stay healthy and well. It's how we are kept in the one true faith. This precious gospel of salvation in Jesus. Let's just do this experiment. The first time you miss church, then for the next week, every day, you miss one meal. The second time you miss church, then every day you miss two meals and so forth. Now ask yourself, how long before you can no longer function? You can't function mentally, you can't function physically. And by the way, if you want to, you can even do this on a weekly basis. Miss church once, miss just one meal a week. Miss church twice, two meals a week, and so on. And then I'm going to tell you, you and I know people. You and I know people, supposedly God's children, and they haven't eaten in months. And they no longer remember God's grace and mercy, His love and compassion for them. And you can see that their life is a struggle and their faith has been weakened or their faith has even died. But they will claim they are as faithful as ever all the while they're laying on their spiritual hospice bed. God's wonder in Jesus is awesome. Please know God's plan for you. His plan is your eternal life. And I say, hear and believe. Wonder and marvel in Jesus. Be sealed in the Holy Spirit through the word of truth. The gospel of your salvation. Amen. Gracious and merciful Father, we are humbled that once again you have given us the message of your Son, Jesus Christ, through your holy word. What an awesome thing it is to hear about this marvel of Jesus, our Lord and Savior from sin. But all too often people don't grasp your grace and mercy and love. They don't see that how from the very beginning you planned all things for our eternal life and salvation. And you planned all things for everyone. You gave everyone that opportunity to hear and believe in Jesus. But souls want to despise you and your holy word. Souls want to turn away from Jesus and what he has done for us. Dear Jesus, we come and thank you for what you have done, for your sacrifice on the cross, for your resurrection from the dead, for the fact that because of you we have eternal life and salvation and all we need do is believe in your holy name to trust that your salvation is true and factual and sufficient unto eternal life. Dear Lord, don't let us doubt this truth. Don't let us wander away from this truth. But with your Father, please send upon us your Holy Spirit. And through that Spirit and the means of grace, the gospel and word and sacrament, keep our hearts and minds in the true faith. Keep our hearts and minds focused on your Son, Jesus, and what he has done. It's not about what we do or how we accomplish things, but about Jesus and his salvation. Be our help, our guide, our stay, and our strength. And dear Lord, we come to you on behalf of the members of our congregation. For all of those who are sick and ailing, who may be struggling or facing trial and tribulation of some sort, be their help and strength. Remind them that in Jesus there is nothing to worry about, for Jesus has done all things necessary for our eternal life and salvation. Help them, dear Lord, to simply trust Jesus do not let their difficulties pull them away from this marvel and wonder of eternal life and salvation that is given in Jesus. We ask these things, dear Lord, because we need this so badly. We need your help, your strength, your wisdom to simply get by in this world. Well, dear Jesus, we come to you in these words and in the words of the prayer you have taught us. Our Father... 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen.